Hello and welcome back to The Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 51 called The Rise of Aetius. In the last episode, we heard about how the eastern half of the Roman Empire asserted its authority over what remained of the western half by placing the six-year-old emperor Valentinian III on the throne in AD 425. Having child emperors wasn't the best idea for an empire that was crumbling under the weight of barbarian invasion. But... As the Romans faced the collapse of their traditional value system, they clung on ever more desperately to the concept of dynastic legitimacy. Theoretically, this wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Roman history was plagued by civil war, normally between rival emperors, and allegiance to one imperial dynasty was actually a reasonably logical way of trying to prevent civil war. For example, when Diocletian's tetrarchy failed, it was Constantine who'd re-established the idea of having one imperial family ruling the empire. But theory and practice sometimes don't mix well. And in the case of the 5th century Roman Empire, they didn't mix well at all. For what happened in 425 was the creation of yet another power vacuum in the West. As you heard in the last episode, since Valentinian III was only six, this meant that imperial authority rested with his mother, Galla Placidia, and she had three main subordinates governing the three parts of the empire that could still be called Roman – or at least reasonably Roman. The most senior was Felix in Italy, the Magister Militum Praesentalis, who had replaced Castinus, the general who'd led the rebellion with the Emperor John. Castinus had fled, and fortunately for him, just escaped the grisly fate that befell John. We know very little about Felix other than he came from Constantinople where he had some sort of position in Theodosius II's court and was regarded as a loyal servant of the Eastern Emperor. So his appointment as Placidia's right-hand man was an attempt by the Eastern Empire to keep the West under their control. The next most senior was Bonifacius in North Africa, who'd stayed loyal to Placidia and the Theodosian family when Castinus and John had rebelled. The third and last was, of course, the new kid on the block who was given Gaul, or what was left of it, to rule. This was Aetius, the man who would now become crucial to the future of the Western Empire. I mentioned in the last episode how Aetius had an unusual background. As a young man, he'd been sent as a high-ranking hostage, first to the Goths and then to the Huns. His stay with the Huns seems to have been a big success and gave him unique access to the Hunnic ruling elite, in particular the two most powerful Hunnic kings at this time, who were called Octar and Rua. This was really the basis of his career, for, as mentioned in the last episode, he'd been given command of Gaul as an incentive to back down with the force of Huns he'd suddenly appeared with to support the usurper John. Aetius was no slouch, and the first thing he did was to throw himself into defending and expanding his new territory. In 426, the Visigoths, who'd been settled in Aquitaine, supposedly as Roman allies under the Treaty of 418, which Constantius III had negotiated, were not behaving like allies at all. In fact, led by their king, Theodoric I, they were besieging Arles, the Roman capital of Gaul, situated on the south coast. Aetius took what was left of the Roman army in Gaul and rescued the city by forcing the Goths to withdraw. Now you're probably thinking, hey, that sounds impressive, defeating the Goths. Not many people have been able to do that. 
But I don't think it was really like that. Our sources are very vague about what happened. And if we piece together the little we have, the truth is probably that there was no battle. The Gothic king Theodoric was a savvy operator and he didn't really want an open war with the Romans. After all, technically, he still had a treaty with Ravenna and he also knew Aetius personally from the days when he'd been a hostage with the Goths. Indeed, he could argue his attack on Arles was actually helping the rightful Emperor Valentinian III because it happened when the Western Empire was under the control of the usurping Emperor John. So, with a new regime in Ravenna and Aetius on the scene as Valentinian's general, I think he just backed down and in 427 he agreed a renewal of the peace of 418 and hostages were exchanged. But this didn't stop Aetius claiming a victory. He returned to Ravenna in triumph, but only to find himself embroiled in a brutal game of power politics. This was because Placidia was trying to stop any of the senior men in the Western Empire from challenging her authority. The real problem was that in 5th century Rome, no woman could hold an official executive position. So Placidia was constantly vulnerable to men who wanted to seize power from her. Now Felix was the most senior and he decided to make a play for supreme power. First, he tried to eliminate Bonifacius in North Africa by sowing the seeds of discord between him and Placidia. He lied to Placidia that Bonifacius was about to set up his own breakaway North African empire and that she should recall him immediately. At the same time, he wrote to Bonifacius telling him that Placidia would shortly recall him to Italy, where she planned to have him executed. Bonifacius fell straight into the trap. He read Felix's letter, and then he received Placidia's order to return to Italy. He believed Felix, and he refused to go to Italy. This confirmed that he was a traitor in Placidia's eyes. She instructed Felix to send an army to North Africa, which he did but Bonifacius defeated it quite easily. It's worth mentioning that some of our sources say that it was Aetius, not Felix, who tricked Bonifacius, but historians are almost unanimous in thinking this was a later attempt to discredit Aetius, because although he was just as scheming and backstabbing as any good Roman, at this stage he simply didn't have the political credibility to be able to tell Placidia that Bonifacius was a traitor. So Aetius wasn't to blame for the mess that was about to unfold. Indeed, he was doing what a Roman general should be doing, which was fighting the barbarians. He went back to Gaul and attacked the Franks who were expanding their territory along the Rhine. It's worth just mentioning here that Aetius's Gallic legions were probably not a very powerful military force. As discussed in episode 47, the Roman army in the early 5th century was a shadow of its former self, especially in the West, where the Romans used barbarians as mercenaries to fight their wars, and Aetius, as we will hear more about, was particularly good at using the Huns. So, while we have no evidence on which to base any assessment of Aetius' army, it was probably only a few thousand Roman legionaries and cavalry. This meant that he avoided large-scale battles with the Franks, but he put pressure on them with ambushes and by occupying strategic positions like bridges and hilltops. Equally, like the Goths, the Franks didn't want an all-out war with the Romans, and they were quite happy to agree to a treaty respecting the Romans' rule in central and southern Gaul. So, good job, Aetius. Meanwhile, back in the corridors of power in Ravenna, Felix's treacherous plans were about to detonate in his hands, because in 429, Placidia realised he was double-crossing her. She sent envoys to Bonifacius who were shown the letter Felix had written telling Bonifacius not to return to Italy because she was planning to execute him. The mist was lifted from her eyes and she saw that Felix had to be dealt with. So she ordered a halt to hostilities in Africa and reinstated Bonifacius – 
But Felix was still very powerful. He had the Italian legions under his control and he certainly wasn't going to step down. So what could Placidia do? She had no choice but to turn to Aetius. Because Aetius had been doing a good job in Gaul, it was easy to promote him from Magister Militum to the next rung up the ladder, Magister Militum Presentalis, the position just below Felix, who was still commander-in-chief of all the Western armies. By doing this, Placidia was throwing down the gauntlet to Felix and setting him up for a fight with Aetius. And Aetius was quick to see This was his chance. But in 430, he was distracted by two barbarian invasions. First, by a renegade goth called Anulsus, who was ravaging Roman territory around Arles, and then by a German tribe of Yutungi, who invaded Raetia. Aetius moved fast, and using the tactics he'd learned from the Huns, like ambushes, he defeated both invaders, who were probably not very numerous anyway, and then he returned to Ravenna, in triumph. There Felix was waiting for him. It was showdown time. Our sources say that Aetius claimed Felix was plotting against him. This was almost certainly true, although we don't know exactly what Felix's plot was. Aetius had taken some of his Gallic troops to Ravenna, but it was actually the Italian legions who turned against Felix, deciding that they preferred a general like Aetius, who'd established a good track record fighting the barbarians, against Felix, who was more of a court politician than a soldier, they seized Felix, his wife and some of his supporters and executed them. Aetius had triumphed and was now in control of Italy and Gaul. Or was he? Because Placidia now panicked. She'd got rid of Felix, but now she had Aetius in Ravenna. She'd merely replaced one would-be tyrant with another. So she turned to her other general, Bonifacius, and recalled him to Ravenna. Before we continue with what would now become a full-blown war between Aetius and Bonifacius, we need to look at a development that was taking place at exactly the same time and would prove to be the final nail in the coffin of the Western Roman Empire. For, as the Romans were stabbing each other in the back, the Vandals were invading the last province in the West which was worth having, North Africa. Let's pause to look at the state of the Roman Empire in the year 430. To be honest, things had never looked worse. It was surrounded by enemies, while the Persians on the eastern border were less of a threat because they were distracted by the appearance of the Huns. There was a host of barbarian tribes, either tramping through the Western Empire or about to do so. The most menacing were, of course, the European Huns, now camped north of the Danube on the Hungarian plain, although at this time they weren't directly attacking the Roman Empire. That would come later. But the Western Empire was in chaos. The Visigoths were settled in Aquitaine, the Franks, Burgundians and Alemanni were occupying most of Western Gaul, and Spain was almost completely lost to the Vandals, Alans and Suevi. And of course, let's not forget the misty island of Britain, although no one knows exactly what was happening there because we have no surviving records at all. But we can safely assume that the Saxons and Angles had sailed across and weren't exactly behaving themselves. Now, let's focus on Spain, because that was the springboard for the invasion of Africa. Back in 409, you'll remember that Spain had been invaded by four barbarian tribes, two sets of Vandals, the Hasdings and Siling tribes, and a group of Alans and German Suevi. But by 418, these had formed one supergroup of barbarians led by the Hasding Vandals. In 428, they acquired a new leader called Geyseric. Geyseric would go on to become one of the most important people in the 5th century. The 6th century historian Jordanes, in his History of the Goths called the Getica, has left us with a description of Geyseric. <laughs> 
Quote, he was a man of moderate height and lame in consequence of a fall from a horse. He was a man of deep thought and few words, holding luxury in disdain, furious in his anger, greedy for gain, shrewd in winning over the barbarians, and skilled in sowing the seeds of dissension to arouse enmity. End quote. Geiseric's great vision was to create a Vandal kingdom in North Africa, or to be more precise, in the region around Carthage in modern-day Tunisia. The rationale for this was fairly obvious. You're familiar that Roman North Africa was the breadbasket of Rome and the Western Empire's most prosperous province after Italy itself. It was not only grain that was exported, but also olives, wine and pottery. These were, of course, produced all over the empire, but the success of the African exports was largely due to the state-subsidised shipping service, which existed to help the grain trade, but which was cleverly used by merchants as cheap transport for other goods. Because of this vibrant trade, Carthage had grown to become one of the largest Roman cities, with probably over 100,000 inhabitants, and was famous for its wealth. Indeed, many Roman senators had huge estates in North Africa. So Geyseric's plan to conquer North Africa made a lot of sense, just as Alaric had wanted to take his Goths there after he sacked Rome in 410. The only problem was the Vandals had little experience of sailing, and so in the late 420s they concentrated on acquiring this knowledge by gathering boats and practising their maritime skills by raiding the Balearic Islands. By 429, Geyseric felt ready to make the crossing, and he occupied the port of Tarifa, just 39 miles across the Strait of Gibraltar from North Africa, where the modern town of Tangiers is located. In May 429, some 80,000 Vandals and Allens sailed across the strait, probably just a handful each day in a fairly small number of boats, rather than a huge armada. Their invasion worked because there was no Roman army to oppose them, since most of it was based in the east, where the main towns were. Now, I can't help thinking that if the Romans hadn't been fighting each other the whole time, and had had a capable emperor or a leader like Stilicho, or as Aetius was to become, they might have anticipated this and done something about it. But no such luck, and they would pay the price for it. The Vandals advanced slowly along the North African seaboard, meeting very limited Roman resistance, and taking about 12 months to reach the second largest Roman town in North Africa, Hippo Regius, where the great Saint Augustine lived. Outside it, Bonifacius finally met them with his army, but was defeated. The Vandals weren't good at siege warfare and settled down to a long siege. Then, in early 431, help appeared for the Romans in the form of an eastern Roman fleet and army. Theodosius II and Pulcheria had decided that the fall of Carthage represented a threat to the Eastern Empire which couldn't be tolerated, and this view would dominate Eastern Roman military strategy for the next hundred years. The Eastern Roman army was led by the capable general Aspar, but even he couldn't defeat the Vandals, and in a second battle sometime in early 432, the Romans were forced to retreat. This time, they abandoned Hippo, which Geyseric took, and no doubt sacked savagely in retribution for the protracted siege. But despite the loss of Hippo and two defeats at the hands of the Vandals, Aspar's eastern army was able to hold on to what remained of Roman North Africa, which was essentially the province of Byzacena, approximately similar to modern Tunisia, with Carthage its capital. This was the bit of North Africa worth having, so it wasn't yet a complete disaster for the Romans. But this is where Roman politics and backstabbing intervened yet again. Let's go back to our narrative. 
After Felix's execution, Placidia decided Aetius was becoming too powerful. So she recalled Bonifacius to Italy, despite the dangerous situation with the Vandals, and made him the senior commander-in-chief of all the Western armies. Aetius was away in Gaul, fighting the Franks in the north, and since he was far away, Placidia stripped him of his command. This was a brutal move, and not surprisingly, caused Aetius to gather his Gallic army and march on Italy. Oh dear Placidia, I must admit I don't think she handled things at all well. Given Aetius's reputation on the battlefield, the smart money must have been on his defeating Bonifacius. But, surprise, surprise, Bonifacius met Aetius near Rimini and defeated him. So, what happened? Unfortunately, our sources simply don't tell us. Presumably, the Gallic army wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. Aetius hadn't hired the Huns to help him, and without them, the Italian legions simply beat the Gallic ones. Was it game over for Aetius? Far from it. Bonifacius was mortally wounded in the battle and passed his position to his son-in-law, Sebastianus. Aetius fled to his country estates and when Sebastianus tried to assassinate him there, he returned to his friends, the Huns. In 433, Aetius arrived at the court of the Hunnic king, Rua. It isn't clear what agreement was struck, but it was sufficient for him to return to Ravenna, either with a force of Huns or with a promise by Rua to invade if he wasn't restored to his previous position. Although Sebastianus tried to contact the Visigoths to secure their help against Aetius, he was unsuccessful, and Placidia was forced to recognise Aetius as the new commander-in-chief of the entire Western army. Her battle to maintain her authority had failed. Aetius had won. He was now the real ruler of the Western Empire. However, with the Vandals in Africa, that empire was crumbling before his eyes. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, of course, I'd be delighted for any ratings or reviews in whichever podcast app you use. And in the next episode, which will be in two weeks' time on the 11th of February, since I'm still working on the fast approaching publication of my second book, we'll continue with the dramatic story of Aetius and his battle to save the Western Empire. Thanks for listening and see you next time. 